mentioned that he saw a nice talk from someone at Genalia uh, where they have, uh, have, it's a little bit relevant to what we have here, um, a, a, an attractor model, a continuous attractor model for representing 3D orientations. Um, yeah. that, uh, that they said that it's going to be on the archive soon, but it's not there yet. Uh, but he mentioned that. He saw the talk. Yeah. Is it, does it, I mean, that's, we were been just talking about this. Did you get any clues as to what? Yeah, that, I, I, I haven't asked him any details about yeah. it. Do you think that talk is online? What did he say? Do you think that talk is online? No, I don't think so. Ah, too bad. That seems to be the, the, the hot topic here, so. All right, who wants to go first? 90 seconds, Mark? I mean, mine's more open-ended. Well, yeah. I don't worry about uh, okay. <laughs> 90 seconds, so, 90 minutes, one of those two. No, I'm, I'm happy to go first, or if you... No, it's not bad. Okay. Um, sure, I'll, 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 I'll go ahead and go, yeah, because okay. then you'll give us like a good cutoff. It's like, we'll, we'll switch to you at some point. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've spent a lot of time just staring at, well, um, in their last meeting, we talked about a way, I'm not going to go into total detail on it, but a way of representing uh, 3D orientations using, maybe using two populations, where one is essentially the head direction cells, or something similar to head direction cells that moves along a 1D ring, mm -hmm. uh, and another population that is, that is 2D, it could, be, it, could be it could be visualized as take a globe and put a cell all over the surface, cells all, all over the surface. In some sense, it's a 2D orientation, but we're calling it a reference vector, because yeah. it's, it's anchored to the object. Yeah. But in some sense, it's, a, it's another 2D orientation. Yeah. Right? Um, so um, I would just, in staring at this, I was trying to come up with, like, what are clear ways of describing what these are? Um, and in some cases, this can be simply described as the gravity vector. It can be described as saying what way is down or what way is up yeah. or something, in some cases. Um, but it's hard to put clear language on what this is when, like, when you're standing on one wall, it rotates as you rotate. As you're sitting on this wall, it rotates as you rotate. It's hard to put clear language on it. Um, so my observation. Think, by, by the way, do you think it's important to put clear language on it? I, uh, if it's possible, yeah. Just to, I mean, just it's to always, be able to like in the think old days. You know, better. if you think about like, the two D room, you can say, oh, that's the orientation of the head of the room, right? So, but now it's not like that at all. Now it's this wonky thing. Yeah. So, um, so here, like the the most succinct explanation I can give of this, the the clearest one is. Um, what this represents is if you take your current plane um, and rotate it toward the gravity vector, this will point in your current direction. Uh, th this tells you what direction you'll be pointing if you take your current plane and rotate it to the gravity vector. Uh, so, okay. um, it, it, that's but just the most... But isn't is that... Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, it took me an annoyingly long time to come up with that simple explanation. It, it, like what this represents is it points what direction you will be pointing after tilting your plane directly toward yeah, the zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Do you think that's helpful? Uh, yeah. I, well, I mean, it might help know you logically you thinking yeah, yeah. about it in your head. I just should, uh, yeah. If I were to like try to describe this to someone in English, yeah. Uh, you're right. Yeah, well, I, I guess that's the question. Not as, uh, I mean, my, my, obviously my intuition is like, eh, that may not be so helpful yeah. for a, an no, average the, lay explanation. Yeah, the main goal here is to be able to think about it yeah. clearly. Yeah. And, and yeah, maybe inch toward a good English explanation if it's possible. It's like I'm, maybe, I'm, maybe we're a little bit closer to being able to explain it clearly with this explanation, but it's not quite there yet. Yeah. But yeah. And that is my entire topic for today, was just to say that you can think of this as uh, you know, take the plane, rotate it, so there's a coplanar with the ground, uh, and now this points in your current direction. Yeah. You know, another way I could think about that is, um, uh, is the following. You know, I've, I've been talking recently about, um, like, uh, you're in one location, and you can infer your, infer your the structure around you as a, as a sensory motor problem in orientation. Right. You know, you, you're building a model of the space around you instead of linear space and, and doing it in uh, um, uh, orientation space. And um, in that case, it feels like every point I can look at here is like the point is the 
the is the circle of the dots on it, right? So I can come here, 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 here. But at any point, if I look at any particular point, I can rotate my head like this, right? And so it's sort of like this. If I think about a set of objects around me, and I'm now going to observe those objects, well, it, it, and correct me if I'm wrong about this. It feels like the thing I'm looking at is the, is the is the two D point relative to the to the gravity vector, if you will. Um, but then the orientation cells are just, just any, if, I, no matter, if, if I'm always looking at some point there and I just rotate my head, th those cells are going to change. It's sort of like, it's reminding me of sort of like we've talked about being on an object and not knowing the, the location, not knowing the orientation. Now I'm at a point in the, in the, 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 the orientation space, and I'm not changing my point in orientation space, but I'm rotating around it. Um, so they seem qualitatively different. You know what I'm saying? Like if I was thinking about what I see in a room, uh, the object I'm seeing is going to be determined by the 2D space, but the actual orientation of that presentation in my eye would, would, uh, has to be determined by that guy. Um, would that be correct too, you think? Is that a, it's, just, it's, just a, it's different. It's just a different way of thinking about it. Um, um, I guess it seems like all of this depends on how you set it, set this up, uh, because if you think of this as, well, by my mental model, these cells right now are rotating for me. Uh, yeah. Which means, my, and my eyes are looking at totally different things, no matter. Uh, well, but it, that doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean that that's not changing too, right? Um, I mean, if you're on, if, uh, on that sphere, the plane with the rat on the sphere there, right? If, it's so hard to translate that to real world. Uh, but, I mean, um, the fact that you're changing in the 2D space does not mean the 1D space won't be changed. Well, with what I just said, the 2D space is not changing. Really? If the, well, if it's, if it's representing a gravity vector, uh, it's, gravity is staying in the same place in my egocentric frame. Oh, I see what saying. It's totally non obvious. Uh, so my interpretation of the 2D, 2D thing was incorrect then. You're saying, uh, even if I was just spinning around in a circle, uh, that that point on the gravity vector sphere is not going to change. Right. Um, unless, uh, okay, if you're standing coplanar to the ground, yeah. And you spin in a circle. But if my head is tucked up at an angle, it would change. It would be making circles on your yeah. head or something yeah, like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and as you look, as you saccade up and down, this changes. Yeah. All right, so that interpretation was wrong. My, my interpretation was wrong. That's not a good way to think about it. Um, it's kind of wonky to think about this problem. I find it a little bit difficult. Um, uh, to just uh, maybe that's what you're trying to do internalize what this means. Um, you know, I look at that and imagine, oh, that's my that's why I'm pointing around, you know, my position right now. But it's really not. It's it's a it's a position relative to the gravity vector. And so your point is, um, my orientation on relative to the gravity. If I'm looking at a, I'm looking at perpendicular to the gravity vector, and I change my orientation, the gravity vector doesn't represent doesn't change. It's weird. Have you, is in that paper, or have you learned anything else, or thought of anything else, about how that 2D uh, gravity vector reference point is, would be implemented in the, where, what cells might be recorded? I, I haven't put any more time into that since we last talked. No. And so all I said was just that, uh, I don't know, it could be something like this, maybe we could get clues the from the paper, system. The paper, the paper doesn't really talk, the paper, the paper only paper, talks about these The cells. paper sort of uh, deduces that that must exist, is that the idea? Yeah, but it, it talks about it always analytically as, yeah, as yeah. Terms, so in terms my, of but the right. The paper says, hey, we, we see these weird things going on with the, with the head direction cells, and an explanation for that would be as if this mythical or this uh, gravity vector existed. And if the gravity vector existed and it worked like this, then we would explain the wonkiness of the, of the head direction cell. Is that, is that the correct? Yeah. I still haven't read that paper yet, I'm sorry. Um, so it's sort of a deduced thing. This seems like it might or must exist given the way uh, head direction cells perform. All right. Um, all right. 
I need this. I, re I want to spend time on this. I just haven't been doing it. Um, uh, okay, that was helpful. Thanks, Marcus. All right, super tired. I also feel like this is, we're t think, trying to think about two three-dimensional quantities. One is location and orientation, and yeah. how they all relate. You know, I think, you know, we talk about whether simulations are necessary or not. Yeah. I would think some sort of simulations are just to see that, make sure that the ideas actually work okay, and it's not a big, uh, so I think it's very difficult to think about multiple high dimensional things and how they interrelate and get it actually. Well, that's right. the difference between you and me, I think. It's like. Uh, but like you just talked about an intuition which was incorrect. Yeah, but, but, and, and but, but, was, but my intuition, but, but my, as always I say, when you, uh, your intuition, I, that was a very point into, if you end up with the whole system working, like you end up with a way of understanding how all the pieces fit together into the biology, then I'll be very confident that it's correct. At this point, I was just trying out an idea and without even any implementations for the biology. So um, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you, but it was like when we did the sequence memory and all that stuff, I felt like, oh, it's going to work. And other people felt like, oh, maybe we don't really know. Well, we really learn things when we do it. We discover problems, but the basic idea. So I feel, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying I think we can, personally, I feel I can make progress on this, uh, just talking to Marcus and thinking about it. Um, but, uh, but but it, there's value in simulating it too, so. Um. Yeah, I think if we come up with some sort of a network architecture like Marcus is working on there, then. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I, I just feel like I, I, I will never really understand something. Personally, it's my personal issue. I yeah, we need to do both. I, I yeah. don't understand something until I have this sort of intuitive feel about it and say, oh, I get it all. And then the simulations are kind of useful, but um, I mean, that's how I have to think about it. Um, so I, maybe Marcus could be doing some simulations soon, like you did early on with the grid cell stuff. That was helpful. Um, um, yeah. OK. Nothing else on that? Bing, bing, bing. Is it really going to give an update? I'm um, sure. This is kind of a progress update, not really anything. That's good. This is a legal conclusion. Thank you, everybody. No conclusion. You want the window shut? Yeah, I recognize that paper. paper. Huh? <laughs> I know that paper. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is just basically a progress report on what Lewis and I have been working on since we published this paper here. Um, so this paper, some of the, um, the next steps, the big next step here is to scale it up. Yeah. So we showed, um, where is it? Uh, the easiest chart to see. So we, sh we showed this kind of accuracy with noise for NNIST and Google speech commands. But these are fairly small data sets. And um, in the machine learning community, you really have to get stuff uh, scaled to larger uh, data sets and networks to actually get things working in a, in a realistic scenario. So that's what we've been working on. And the other part is um, we've been transitioning everything from Python 2 to Python 3. So we're fully in Python 3 now. So Lewis created lupic.torch, which contains our PyTorch libraries, and you can, uh, anyone can use this now in Python 3. Uh, yeah, there, there are a bunch of examples here of how you can replicate uh, our work. So the main thing with the, <laughs> main thing I've been scratching my about is how to uh, scale this up nicely um, and w in this in the when you think about image recognition um, <laughs> is that, from, is that from this paper? <laughs> no this is not this is from another paper <laughs> so uh, there's a bunch of work in scaling networks up to large-scale problems like CFAR and image 10 image net I should say um, this is all convolutions <laughs> <laughs> so here's like a typical like popular Thing which is called ResNet, uh, which uses these skip connections. And I've talked about this yeah, before yeah, in the meetings. Yeah. Um, but the skip connections basically allow you to um, uh, pass the learning signal more efficiently through the networks. And it allows you to have very deep networks. 
And because it's faster to train, or because it's performance. It's better? faster to train. Without it, it's uh, without these things, it's sort of exponentially harder to train. Yes. With the more layers. With the more layers you get. So they're trying to get around the fact that you got so many damn layers, and they're trying to do back prop on every one. Yeah. 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 Um, but it's it's interesting because I mean we also have skip connections in in the neocortex. That's yeah. Kind of an interesting thing yeah. to think about. Um, so this is ResNet. They have a particular way of combining the skip connections. This one, when I looked at it, is not really conducive to sparse representations. Mm. Um, uh, there's something else called... Can I just ask a quick question about that yeah. picture? That one's showing a 34-level uh, network, you said? If you go up there, um, is that right? I mean, yeah. I always thought these vision networks were over 100 layers. Yeah, the, because they could only fit this on the... <laughs> Well, it says uh, uh, yeah, so well, it says a 34 layer network, so I didn't know that. Yeah, so that's, they basically, in this paper, they come up with a block that can be repeated. And they're showing in this picture a 34 layer network, but um, most of what they do is much, many more layers. Okay, so my, uh, like that hasn't changed. changed. My, 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 my common statement that these things are typically 100 or more layers is not incorrect. Yeah, quite often. Like here, they have the 101 version of that, the 152 layer version of that. Yeah. 50 layer version is what's commonly used and on a lot of different things. Uh, so. And, and production version, or I mean, that, that's good. It works well. Uh, it's it gets to a question of accuracy versus speed. Mm -hmm. So the higher, the, the the more layers you have, the better accuracy you get. Yeah. But um, you can see here the flops here increases yeah. uh, appropriately. Yeah. Okay. Um, then there's another way of doing skip connections called that was in this dense net paper, and uh, the way they do skip connections is a lot more conducive to sparsity because uh, they're not adding connections; they're just concatenating them, so they just become another input, which is kind of the way it is in neuroscience. Say again, and I can. So uh, with ResNet, what they do is they take. The, the connection that's coming from previous layers, yeah. and they literally mathematically add the vectors to the input that's coming from the layer below. Add them, uh, like, like a union or Not union, just math, uh, add them. Oh, add them. Yeah. Like oh, numerical numbers. Numerical, numerical numbers, they oh. just add them. That uh, seems like a, or subtract them. That yeah. seems like an odd thing to do. Yeah. Uh, but if you. <laughs> Does that mean, mean anything? Yeah. Um, I can draw that on the board. Uh, I don't know if there's a uh, in an equation uh, format. Back to report, but FG. Yeah, the idea is that, uh, and I mentioned this before. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> it's hard to do without erasing <laughs> something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A little mouse on the sphere has been here for a while, though. Um, The idea is that if you have some input coming in X, you have a network here, it's creating some really, uh, it's, it's modeling some complicated function f of X yeah. here. This is this big nonlinear thing. Yeah. And in many cases, um, it's, you can, it's easier mathematically to model this as G of X minus x, so it's the difference between x and some other function, you model it as that. Um, and that, for certain types of functions, this is much easier to model, because you already have x here. Mm -hmm. And so that's the intuition behind um, these things, is here, if you do a subtraction operation mm -hmm. here, basically now this is modeling g of x, okay. which is a much simpler function. Okay. So, so uh, where does this so adding that's, come into play? So that, that's, that's this. Oh, the, it's really adding, it's really subtracting. subtracting yeah. I see what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can, that's plus awesome. and minus, you can. You can and it's not, it's, it, this apparently is obvious to some people that this is easier to calculate g of x and f of x. It's not all clear to me why that's the case. Um, There's some it, functions where this is, this is much easier. That was their kind of rationale for it, I think, is this, the residual, it's modeling this residual. Yeah. They call it residual yeah. networks, yeah. ResNets. Um, okay. uh, and, but also it's convenient because if you're backpropagating these errors, if you do this repeatedly, you're, you have a shortcut for passing the error down to. So that was nice yeah. for my back process. Okay. Right? But this subtraction operation, if either of these are sparse, it just destroys the sparsity. 
no, yeah. they're not sparse anymore. Yeah. So, um, so I decided. Uh, so to the trick they're using doesn't work with sparsity. I don't think so. Maybe uh, there probably is a way to make it work, but I, I didn't spend yeah. too much time. But it's kind of a trick. I mean, it's it a trick. Yeah. It doesn't look like it's a biological thing. So. No. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, okay, so. so then there's these dense, dense nets, and what they do, sorry, <laughs> what they do is that uh, instead of the, uh, instead of doing a subtraction, they just you, know, you have this, and this just gets added, so you have a wider vector coming in. So you just have more. But it's concatenated. Concatenate. Concatenate. And that would be like in the neocortex. And then yeah, maybe. Science. it's just yeah. you have fibers coming here and you have fibers coming there and they're just all there. So how does it relate to the one we just talked about where they're doing subtraction? They're not doing subtraction. This is a totally different thing. Yeah. So, oh, so the, subtraction, the, subtraction, <laughs> the uh, subtraction made it more trackable. What does this do then? This is uh, does it have the same sort of benefits? Is a so it has the same benefits that you can yeah, you can uh, shortcut around shortcut it. it, but now you, your vector coming out of here is twice as wide. Yeah. And as you go up, and if you keep doing this, it, it gets three times as wide and four times as wide, and you know mm -hmm. it just keeps yeah. increasing. Yeah. Um, so that's the problem with this. But they have a way of um, what they call these bottleneck layers of bringing these. Well, so our, back in down. some sense, a spatial pooler is always is like does that every time, right? You, yeah. A spatial pooler yeah. can take any dimensional input and output yeah. a different dimension. Exactly. So they have something analogous to that in, inside uh -huh. these dense blocks that brings uh -huh. it back together again. Okay. So I felt this was a little nicer. And so you now think, oh, I maybe I can apply the sparse to this one. If I can't do it yeah. to the, sp the sparse resonance, we can do it to the dense block. Network. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and. These networks, it turns out, you can also have many fewer weights and still get the same results. Uh -huh. So um, they do all these comparisons here, comparing with uh, resonance and <laughs> see the parameters are a lot smaller. Yeah. With the switch. Yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, so you can get, you can use many fewer parameters. You still end up with. 50 to 100 layers, uh -huh. so still a lot of layers. Um, but what's going on inside here is is somewhat complicated. Um, so that's what I've been trying to figure out. Do you um, think in the end that, I mean, are dense, these dense block techniques is, are competitive with the, with the ResNet? Yeah. They're competitive. They're competitive with it. Um, I mean, the purpose of doing these things is to speed up learning and but not necessarily make it more robust. No, there, there's yeah. no one, almost no one talks about robustness. All right. It's yeah. all accuracy of the yeah. benchmarks. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. You know, this, you know, I'm painting a broad brush, but 95% yeah. uh, of people don't talk about robustness. So, but the point, the important point here is that if you said, okay, now if we, if we could scale this up to a larger system that's more sort of uh, mainstream, yeah. um, you don't want to do that on a system that doesn't work very well. Right. To begin with. So yeah. that was my question. Like, okay, these dense networks are. are, are these dense networks work as good or better than resonance. Oh, okay. And well, are faster. Okay. And faster and smaller number of weights. Got it. Um, so the, this is not the. This is not the. No, I'm not compromising anything. No, it's not the side technique. This is now coming sort of the main technique. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of people. I, I mean, they're, uh, this thing, every year there's a new trick that people have. Uh, um, so anyway, this is, this is a 2016. So almost ancient times by deep learning standards. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so I kind of understand what this network is doing now, and I'm, but there are many different pieces inside these dense blocks, and then there's these bottleneck like spatial pooler type things that are going on. Yeah. Um, is that the pooling layer, what they call the pooling layer there? Uh, this reduces the resolution yeah, between I mean, here, but then there's stuff in here that oh, reduces sorry. the um, the width of the vector, oh, which is not the that's, same independent, as, that's independent. Yeah, so each of these blocks is um, can have like uh, thirty layers in here. Oh my god! So this, and they have a, like a particular structure. If you want, I can talk through it, but it, mm, it's not really. more com I don't know. If you yeah. know if so how are you doing on this then? So um, well, I have some. Uh, here's oh, kind of where I am now. We're calling this the not so dense net. <laughs> 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 That's courtesy, Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I don't want to. I initially thought of calling it the sparse dense net, but the, uh, that's the end. That's not bad. It rolls off the tongue. And that's the end. Yeah. Um, so the good news is, so there's many different types of layers inside these dense blocks, and uh, if you make one of those types uh, sparse, um, I can get better noise results. Here you can see there's definitely better. So one of the thirty and one of the dense blocks. One of the types of layers in the dense blocks. Okay. So the yeah. dense block has like three or four different types of layers. I see. So, so they all have this sparsity in them, yeah. but only one type of layer. So, so you can add layers. you can add sparsity to one of those types. Yeah, and that's what I got here. The good news is that overall accuracy is still competitive. It's uh -huh. the, um, it's around ninety three percent, which is it's not the best, but it's close. Close. It's it's, it's better than the dense one. Barely. It, it, um, there's a variation here, so. Okay, uh, but still, I mean, every one of those numbers is bigger on the right than the left, so there's nothing to. It's it, it, yeah. It would yeah. be more worrisome if it was the other way. So. Yes. Yes. But I'm not sure. I would. I would not take this difference to be meaningful. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, but as you go down, the differences do become meaningful. So I'm getting a pretty nice bump up with uh, noise. The, but I'm not happy with this right now. I think it should be much flatter. Um, you can see it does drop off pretty fast um, for both of them. Um, it's nothing like the um, results you know, the the MNIST there. results that I was showing. Yeah. Can you yeah, remind me the higher. difference between C part 10 and the MNIST? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. What, what it's, it's, it's much, it's a full color, big color picture, yeah, right? Like not they big. They're, they're thumbnails. Oh, they're thumbnails. Yeah, so. this kind of stuff. So the 32 by 32 color images. Um, and you try to label them properly, categorize them properly. Yeah, awesome. and it's, uh, because it's color, you have three times the information coming in. Right. And this is just really black and white binary. Right. Uh, so it's a lot more information coming in. So it's, it's, it's a significantly harder problem. And, and, more, then, and more categories? Um, there's okay. a CIFAR 10 and a CIFAR 100, uh -huh. which is 100 categories. Yeah. I'm just dealing with the 10 right so now. Really, this is hard because of the color aspect. Of it. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's just, there's a lot of inherent noise in the pictures. A lot of clutter and stuff like that. Um, but the good thing is, stuff that works well on CIFAR 10 often will scale up to ImageNet, whereas that's not true for MNIST. Mm -hmm. right. um, so, mm -hmm. so CIFAR 10 is a pretty good benchmark to look at. So you you did you got this result so far, which is good. Which is good, but it's not. I don't think it's yeah. good so enough. So what? So what's your next step? Is your next step to try to implement more of these types in in sparse? Or yeah. So I've implement I've now implemented the other types in here, and I'm playing around with it. It's just very complicated the training. Um, the other part of it is I'm stepping back just to look at how sparsity is working in just one of these layers. Just on its own, so I can understand it better, uh, rather than trying to just do full black box end-to-end -end kind of training. Um, so, so maybe tweaking how it works in one layer is one direction, and then trying to get different types of layers to do it in another direction. Yeah, yeah. And you're pursuing both those at the same time. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, my focus right now is just to understand the how sparsity works when it's going through these convolutional layers. Just take, forget about the overall end-to-end -end results, just trying to understand that. Um, and the thing that Lewis is doing is there's even simpler versions, simpler networks than these. Uh, mm -hmm. So he's doing an uh, investigation of that. There was mobile net. Yeah, there was mobile net uh, stuff. So he's uh, found a couple of other networks that are simpler that we might be able to do it. But so it's sort of like, it seems a bit like the idea of adding sparsity becomes a complicated thing because each of these networks has its own sort of architecture and tweaks that they do and and depending on which architecture you're playing on, the sparsity, adding sparsity could be a, a separate challenge, is that correct? I think in general that's true. For the most part, the vast majority of networks um, are closer to this than the ResNet. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that they don't do this subtraction mm -hmm. trick. So maybe getting yeah. it to work well here, you would end up I think it will scale. You just uh, go to, not just in terms of the size, but some different variations of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. 
I mean, obviously, you, you wouldn't want to say, well, I'm going to work on this, the one, this the network that came out of this lab, and it's a different variation over here. It, it, you know, it's all over again. Yeah. Um, um, so I'm just trying to understand how sparsity works in convolutional networks a little bit better. Uh -huh. uh, I don't think it'll take that long. It's not that different from the spatial pooler. Um, but I think I need to understand it a little bit better before mm -hmm. I try to uh, say And those networks are based on building blocks. Get a block correctly, we can. I like this code that's block here. Yeah, yeah. They, uh, like they all have this, yeah. this block of convolution of this size. Yeah. Well, as, as long, as, long, the, as, long as the work you're doing could be dropped into many you know, different forms of that block. I mean, you just have different variations of how to arrange the blocks. Well, yeah, as long as the blocks are the same, you get a block to work, and that'd be good. I mean, again, you know, the old, one ultimate goal would be make you want to be, people could try this very quickly on a, you know, ultimately, that's what you'd want, right? If people say, hey, I'm going to drop this into my network and see what happens. And to the extent, the amount of effort they have to go through to do that is going to directly impact how many people try that. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's right. Yeah. Um, all right, well, that's very helpful. Yeah. So that's, uh, the good news is whenever I add sparsity, it, even in a smaller system, it just seems to help always. So mm -hmm. that's uh, trying lots of different variations, and it just always helps in the buses. So that's good. Yeah. All right. That's where we are right now. I'm going through this. Any any uh, sort of anticipated um, like upcoming deadlines? Well, of course, you like like the last time. <laughs> <laughs> so there's an ICML workshop on robustness, robust networks. Uh -huh. um, that's the paper there is due next week. Uh, so if we get anything reasonable, I might submit it by then. It'll be, it'll be just a, a, sh a shorter version of this paper. Yeah. So uh, so one ten, so. Yeah. Ideally, I, I think I could. I mean, I think even here I could, I could add this. And uh, I mean, just it's a workshop, so we don't have to have polished results. I can just said here's where we are, and this is the challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, whether they're accepted or not. I don't know. But, yeah. That's good. Good. That is a forcing function. I don't want to spend forever tweaking parameters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think no. we need to have some good milestones. Yeah, nice to yeah. Seems to work last time, so. Again, that's good. Thank you. That's kind of a progress update. That's good. I'm glad we did that. I was kind of curious as to what was going on. Yeah, we went through like a, a week of sort of software Refactoring software hell, software whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Going through my torch and diamond yeah. issues. And yeah. I picked that up by just listening to the office chat. I was like, oh shit, something like nothing's happening. Like, yeah, like, we we also stuff. switched from, um, you know, how we do parameter searching. We have yeah, I heard about that. And so then it was it just back and forth with Domino, and it's like, oh man. Um, yeah, we're using this for searching now. Yeah. Well, so I go to the this one. They have, have a search. Yeah, so we've. Switch to using this for doing our parameter searching and stuff, and it's a really nice setup. Is that a company? No, it's just an open source. It's a uh, university. But they give it a name and a logo. Yeah. To but it's, it's Berkeley mostly. So they have a lot of stuff that's kind of like hypersearch, yeah. and it can run on a cluster or. On a and it's like they have these cluster gateway systems, and, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's like, oh, it's like, wow, old rock. We were so far mm -hmm. ahead of the market. We yeah. were, we were. <laughs> but now someone else is doing all the hard work, so that's nice. Great. <laughs> Great. That, seems like, that's a, that seems like the story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I started thinking <laughs> someone else does all the hard work. <laughs> not a bad story. It's not a bad story. You kinda, yeah. Yeah. But this is a very nice system for uh, doing parameter searches. But it's not fully mature, so mm. we do have some headaches. You doing this on Domino? Then? Both Domino and laptops, and Lewis has got a. Plus the Mac games. Lewis, Lewis, funny. I said Lewis setting up your, your Twitch stream on the, on the. I said, "Where's the computer?" He goes, "I have four of them right here." I'm like, "Under the He's under the little tray. Oh yeah, I yeah. yeah. yeah, keep them all going, you know. Yeah, it's just his garage, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but they have little things which make things just go two or three times faster, like this median stopping rule. 
just like if you're training a whole bunch of stuff, but one of them isn't progressing fast enough uh, compared to what you've seen in the other thing, you just kill it. Did we have something like that? Um, we at one point did have something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, yeah. But that, that really speeds things up. Yeah, you apply a jobs manager. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like that. And yeah, this can also uh, start up your own AWS cluster for you using Boto. Oh, right. <laughs> and stop after you run the cluster. There's a amount of stuff that can start to run. And oh, and then stop, yeah. <laughs> so it's like all the old stuff we had before. Wow. All right. Cool. All right. Sounds good. Okay. All right. We're done. Okay. I'm going to tell you this chapter done by the end of the week, so.